Okay, hello everyone. Um, how are you all doing? How was your first exam? I hope it went well. Um, good, that's awesome. So um, welcome back to Messer Tutoring today. So um, today we are going to cover muscular skeletal disorder. So this chapter is a long chapter. Um, they have, it have a lot of different diseases and pathologies that we have to know about uh, the different disease relating to the bone and the muscular skeletal system. Um, it's going to be a little longer than uh, regular sessions. So, but I would try to go through some of the stuff that we need to know and the stuff that we don't really need to focus on, I will skim through, or I will tell you guys that you guys don't need to know it, okay? Um, so with that being said, I hope everyone is ready. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and go through this, and then um, you guys can be uh, prepared for uh, the class tomorrow, okay? Please stop me if you guys have any questions, and if you guys, um, have any uh, things that concern, just let me know, okay? All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Ooh. Okay, so a little tips for this topic is, um, we're gonna have to know the difference between the disease process uh, because it can be easily confused. You guys will learn why it's going to be a little bit confusing later. Uh, definitely know the six P's. I'll cover the six P's later. So definitely know the six P's. It will follow you guys into the fifth semester until you guys graduate. Um, and yeah. Okay, before we move on uh, to uh, higher topics, we have to know the basic first. So we have to know uh, joints, tendons, and ligaments. So joints is the place where the ends of two bones are in proximity and move in relation to one another. Um, so there are three types of joints uh, that we have to know. And um, it is the, the sinoarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, and diathroidal synovial. Um, this chapter is going to be is going to have a lot of definitions and theory stuff that we have to know. Um, Professor Lanessa, I'm not probably not going to ask you guys the definition of joint tendons or ligaments. These are just for you guys to know um, so that you guys can better understand the, the chapter the topic. Okay, um, ligaments higher elastic content than tendons provide stability when permitting control movement at joints. Um, so what I would take from this, you guys don't have to know anything, just remember tendons is muscle to bone, ligament is bone to bone. What is muscle to bone? Between the muscle and the bone is the tendons. It is connection between the muscle and the bone. Ligament is a connection between the bone and the bone. That's the only two that I think you guys need to know. Diagnostic test. So bone scan. Uh, is used to identify, evaluate, and stage bone cancer, also used to detect fractures. Uh, nursing management, uh, before patients are going through a bone scan, they have to be NPO, meaning nothing by mouth. Um, in, they have to have an informed consent, and they have to drink 32 ounces to re ensure the excretion of the contrast, monitor post op site for redness, uh, okay, so um, because the bone scan procedure, it uh, required the ingest of the injection of the um, contrast, which is a dye. Uh, it can be very toxic to the kidney. Therefore, by drinking more fluid or water, it helped the kidney excrete and filter the contrast out faster and therefore uh, less toxic to the kidney and the body. Um, so bone scan is basically, it uses radio stoscopes that will collect in the area that indicate abnormal bone metabolism and some fractures. Don't need to know that, just know it used to identify, evaluate and stage bone cancers. All right, bone and muscle biopsy. So whenever we 
see the word biopsy, it means that we take a little sample of that error and then we identify and analyze it. So biopsy is just basically take a symbol, sample of that particular um, area. So it may be done during surgery or by aspiration. Aspiration meaning like they inject a, a huge needle into the bone and they aspirate out a little bit of the, 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 the bone matter. Uh, so of course they need informed consent. We have to monitor the site uh, for redness, uh, sign and symptom of infections, purulent drainage. Uh, we have to elevate the site and also apply ice back. Eye packs. So after the biopsy, again, we have to monitor for bleeding, swelling, hematoma, and severe pain and infections. So what is hematoma? Hematoma is basically a collection of blood that is in the, in the area, is in the fluid pouch in the area. It's not bleeding where the, it's not like a cut and then the patient bleeding outside, but it's bleeding internally and it's formed, it's inside a fluid bag. So it's um, it's in, in internally. So it's, it's like a, a bruise, but it's bleeding inside. Um, elevate the side for 24 hours to reduce edema. So usually uh, after the biopsy, if the, the area is uh, putting down like this, the blood will pour and uh, it's, the venous return is not great. So we, by elevating the legs or the area that they have the biopsy, it promotes the venous return, meaning the blood uh, returning, facilitate the blood to return to the herd and therefore reduce edema and pooling of the blood. Um, apply eyes to prevent hematoma. So eyes will help with vasoconstriction and will help with decreasing hematoma. All right, soft tissue injury, definitely know what is sprain and what is strain, the difference between it. She will ask you guys that on the test. So sprain is the injury to the ligaments surrounding a joint caused by wrenching or twisting motions. And strain is an excessive stretching of muscle, fascial sheath or a tendon. So strain is a excessive stretching where sprain is the injury to the ligament surrounding the joint. Okay, clinical manifestation of both of this is pain, edema, decreased function, and bruising. So what do we do when the patient experience injury to the ligament or experience strain, excessive stretching? We do uh, something called rise. We rest the extremities, the leg, or the, the arm, and then we apply ice, and then we compress the area, uh, then elevate it, okay? Heat pads uh, after 48 hours for no longer than 30, min 30 minutes at a time. I, we start with first for 24 to 48 hours for 20, 30 minutes at a time. So we do ice first and then heat pad after two days. Compression, 30 minutes on and 50 minutes off. Uh, elevate 20 to 48 hours to reduce edema. Okay, dislocation. Complete displacement or separation of the articular surface of the joint. So what is the sign symptom? You guys definitely will see deformities, loss of function of the affected part, local pain, tenderness, swelling, and the limb may be shorter or is this, the, the length of the limb is not equal to the opposite side. So those are the signs and symptoms of dislocations. So what do we do? Whenever a patient have a dislocation, always remember the first thing that we need to do first is immobilization and then realign it. So for example, there's a question regarding dislocation or a fractures, we'll cover that later. The first thing we always do with any orthopedics questions or cases is immobilization. Immobilization first. Immobilization is the first thing, not only to prevent further injury, but also um, it helps with the uh, 
the process of realignment, the bone or the extremity later uh, too. So immobilization is always the first and priority choice for all of the dislocation or fractures questions, okay? Treatment pain, protect injury areas. So we have to do neuro checks as well. So what does it mean neuro check? So we check for the sensation of the extremity. In this picture, this guy may have a dislocation of his shoulder. So we check his arms and his hands to see if he have any sensation, if there's any pose, uh, any, any um, mostly sensation of the arm to see if the dislocation have affected any nerve or any nerve ending at that area. All right, six Ps. Earlier I said uh, we have to know this, so we did definitely need to, you guys have to know the six Ps by heart. Uh, it's really important to know. So the six P is the neuro checks. It is the it's the check that we check for patient who have a dislocations or who have a fractures injury, um, or even who have a cast, okay? So um, the first thing is pain, pale, then paler, meaning like the whiteness, the paleness, the color of the skin. Then poselessness, meaning like the, yeah, makes the poselessness, yeah. Pressures, parathesis, and paralysis. So what occur first? The first thing that always come up is parathesis. That is the feeling, the sensation of like the needles or like yeah, parathesis. Um, uh, that's the first thing that always come up first. Then pain or the feeling of pressure in the arm area, in the area. Uh, then paler, pulselessness and paralysis. Paralysis is complete loss of function of that extremities. And usually it's occur at a very late stage usually the last stage. So we assess to see if the patient has circulation. So the 6P uh, will, we, whenever we don't have a circulation, the blood doesn't reach there because of an obstruction of a dislocation or fractures that occlude the blood to perfuse uh, the area, um, then we usually experience these six Ps and we have to assess patient for these six Ps, okay? Um, so with that being said, pain, paler, postlessness, pressure, parathesis, and paralysis. Parathesia is always the first thing that comes up, okay? That's the first and early sign. So if there's any questions regarding early signs, uh, dislocations, or fractures, parathesia is the first thing that usually come up, and that's the first thing that we're going to check. Okay, next we have fractures. Basically, fracture is a disruption or break in the continuity of the bone, okay? So usually when the patient has a fractures, um, they will have edema, continuous pain, unnatural movement, muscle spasm, deformities, crepitation. Crepitation is like the sound of like uh, the bone whenever they move, I think. Swelling loss of function, discoloration. Muscle spasm usually happens in larger bone. Um, again, intervention for fractures. The first thing that we do when we suspect a patient is having a fractures or dislocations is immobilize. Uh, then we assess for neurovascular status by using the six Ps for open fractures. What is open fractures? Open fractures is when a bone that break and because the bone was sharp, so it's break the skin and cause an open entry for bacteria and causes bleeding. So the bone, it's break out of the skin. Uh, so whenever that happens, we have to cover with sterile dressing to help prevent infections. Immobilize the patient, the benefit of it is to support fractures and decrease movement to prevent further damage and prevent spasms. Also help to maintain the vascular nature of the injury so you don't have paler or poselessness. Splinting help prevent spasm. Okay. Assessment findings for a hip 
fractures. So hip fractures, external rotation, muscle spasm, because the hip area is a big muscle area. It's a big area. Uh, the patient may have shortened of the affected limb. Uh, they will have severe tenderness when we touch on that area and then a vascular necrosis of the femoral head, meaning that like they have a bone death because that area doesn't, does not get perfused anymore. External rotation basically is hip rotating out of place, pointing outwards and they cannot move. So who at risk mostly for hip fractures, older adults, elderly. Nursing intervention for hip fractures, so we have to maintain proper alignment, meaning immobilizations, neurocheck, meaning six piece, no weight bearing, meaning no carrying anything more than two pounds, no picking up their kids, grandkids, or getting grocery back or going to the gym, or my meaning like going to the gym and do weight. Um, SCD is, because uh, SCD, uh, SCD is sequential compression device. Uh, these are like the machine that we see in, in, the, um, in the hospital where they put under the patient uh, leg to continuously compress and promote venous return so that the blood can return to the heart and promote circulation for the body. And so that they don't have developed like DVT or clotting in their feet or their legs. Checking capillary refill, meaning we have to check the cap refill in their toes to see if their toes is being perfusing because the hip is fractured, so it may occlude the blood flow to the toes. So we have to check for the pedal poses, the colors and movement and sensation. Uh, also, we have to maintain proper alignment and avoid extreme hip flexions. SCD is to prevent DVTs, deep vein thrombosis. Um, compare bilaterally is the best way to assess. So we have to check both feet bilaterally, both legs. Overall fractures goals, so alignment reduction, we can do it manually or surgically, um, for, especially for open reduction. Immobilization, we can do skin bug traction or skeletal immobilization. And we, this will help to restore the function. This is the goal of, um, a patient who experiencing uh, fractures or dislocation is to restore the function of that extremity. So manual reduction, meaning close, and old surgical, meaning open. Open reduction is using surgical incision to correct uh, the alignment of the extremity. It used internal fixation, uh, meaning it used the wires and screw uh, so that it can maintain an alignment of the, the extremities. So early ambulation is key. This will help to promote not only circulation, but promote healing and prevent a lot of complication uh, that bed rest patients may experience. So number one complication is infection, and usually it occur in day three. So remember our first lectures, um, we learn about the different uh, complication post-op and usually infection takes three days to develop. And especially for patients who have go through an open reduction where they have wire and screw inside their legs or arms, they are at a significant risk for contracting infections. So we have to continuously monitor, especially on day three. So bug traction, this is a uh, immobilization method. It is most commonly used for hip fractures uh, and it's used pre-operatively, okay? Pre-operatively, it's used for patient pre-op to immobilize the area until they can get an operation on the hip. 
So this is manually immobilized until they have surgery. Once they have the surgery, they won't be in bug traction anymore. So you guys need to know bug traction. It will be covered in the exam. Uh, use the skin to immobilize. We need to do good skin assessment because at increased risk for pressure ulcer because when the patient on bug traction, uh, basically they are on bed rest. So we have to make sure that they are turned, make sure that they are padded and not getting pressure ulcer wound. Uh, going to bathroom, they have to use the trapeze bar. What is the trapeze bar? It's basically a bar that the patient can hold on onto and lift up the, the upper body or the back or the neck um, uh, so that they can remain in the traction and use bed pan. Bed pan, uh, bed pan is the, the pan that they slide under the patient butt uh, so that they can um, go, you know, uh, make sure the weight is always hang freely. So because this is a manually immobilization, AKA bug traction, the, they have to use the weight to counteract uh, with the patient immobilization, you know? Um, it's hard to imagine, but you guys can find a picture online and you guys understand it completely. So the weight when they use to counteract have to always be hang freely. It cannot touch the floor. So that's the thing that I would take away from this. Whenever they talk about bug traction, I always have questions regarding the weight. And it's so simple, you guys. Just make sure that it doesn't touch the floor. Make sure it is hang freely. That's it. Weight on the floor, we have to raise the head of the bed. If the traction is off, we have to call the doctor. If you are not competent to put traction on, then we have to go get someone who, who is so they can fix it. We never lose the traction or we, ne we never turn the patient. So even though the patient is at risk for pressure ulcer wound, we are not allowed to turn the patient because when we turn the patient, it can affect the traction. So the only thing that we can do to prevent pressure also wound is to kind of pat the patient uh, or pat the uh, bony prominences to prevent um, the pressure ulcer. Um, we uh, have to prevent fat emboli. So what is fat emboli we will cover in, in a bit. So next we have another term. It is skeletal traction. So earlier we have bulk traction, now we have skeletal tractions. So it used when prolonged traction is necessary. So earlier bulk traction is only used preoperatively, but now skeletal, it, it, it is to be used uh, for a long period of time. Then, when we, then we use skeletal. The complication is infection, and immobility. So because they use it for a long time and it requires, it is the purpose of it is to immobilize. So of course, the complication will arise from the immobilization. Uh, for this skeletal traction, you guys have to know that we have to do very meticulous skin care. We have to care, uh, clean the crust, serous drainage uh, is okay. Uh, skin care is sep is aseptic, not sterile, meaning we can, we trying to clean it as uh, following aseptic technique, but it does not have to be sterile. We don't have to use a, a sterile gloves for this. Uh, mobility, um, so we have, because it's a more prolonged immobility, so this is a major disadvantage for skeletal traction. If the pins come out, cover it and call MD. Um, so what does that mean? So the difference between bugs and skeletal is for the bugs, they use the weight to counteract and kind of immobilize the patient extremities. Whereas in skeletal, they use the pins to, um, to, and the wire to make sure that the, the, the legs or the extremity is immobilized. So that's why usually on the, on the pin, uh, we, we can see like the crust or like drainage but whenever, whenever there's crust, we have to clean it. And if the pins is coming out, we have to call the doctor. 
the patient is at high risk for osteomyelitis because the pins give direct entry to bone for pathogens. Osteomyelitis basically is infection of the bones and we will cover it uh, more in later. All right, healing process. So this is the healing process. Honestly, you don't really need to know it. It's more anatomy, but nursing, mm -mm. Okay, this you guys need to know, cast. So neurovascular check is a must. So because the patient have a cast, it's kind of put pressure on the area. And what do we afraid of when we put pressure on the area? It may occlude the perfusion of the blood to further extremities. So, so we have to check the six piece, especially uh, if the patient have a cast right here, we have to continuously check the 6P on the hand, the fingers, to make sure that the cast does not occlude the blood, okay? We don't use eye packs for 20, the first 24 hour, hours after we, use, after we have the, the, the cast. Be why? Because eye causes vasoconstriction. It will, even, it will worsen the, um, the perfusion Keep dry and uncovered. We usually try to elevate the cast. Again, elevation will help with uh, preventing edema and promote venous return. Handle with palms while drying. Use hair dryer on cool for itching. So I remember there was question uh, that I do on practice tests that they, 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 they have this and the patient is having a cast and they feel itching, they cannot, they cannot scratch it. But what they, can they do? They use a hair dryer, must use on a cool setting. They cannot use the heat setting, must use the cool setting and um, to elevate the itching. If there's a hot spot, that means that there are issues. So we have to teach the patient to report it to the doctor, of course. Encourage movement to promote circulation, lower extremity cast. So uh, we will talk about that. Okay, so low for lower extremity, we have to elevate above the hurt for first 24 hours only. Do not place cast in dependent or dangle area because swelling and can cause compartment syndrome. So neurovascular ejects are important because the biggest complication cats have is compartment syndrome. Swelling and circulation is cut off. What is compartment syndrome? So compartment syndrome is basically um, whenever we have the cast, it's, a, it's putting pressure and a, it may occlude the pressure and the blood going through it, it causes build up pressure and uh, Ultimately, compartment syndrome is occlusion of the, of the uh, flow of the blood causing no perfusion to the distal extremity. So that is basically compartment syndrome. Um, and no meaning circu no circulation. And the 6P is what we assess for patient who might develop or at risk compartment syndrome. Uh, hot spot is infection sign. And whenever patient complain of pains, when they have cast, we have to give the patient pain medication. And then we assess 45 to one hour later. If they still complain of pain and it has not improved, we have to evaluate the six piece. And then we have to call doctor if there's something wrong. Uh, pain not going away with pain medication means something is wrong. Okay, so earlier I touched a little bit on compartment syndrome. So what are the signs symptoms of compartment syndrome? So basically compartment syndrome is all about circulation. It's all about we, uh, the six piece. Um, it can occur without a cast, uh, no circulation, pain is not relieved by pain medication and can lead to nerve damage and amputation. Um, Fasciotomy is basically, um, they cut open the skin in order to uh, uh, relieve the pressure so that the blood vessel can, can flow the blood to the distal extremities. So fasciotomy is no cast, but the limb has so much swelling, it has to be relieved 
by cutting the skin open to the, relieve the pressure. So whenever the patient have burn, for example, the fluid will shift from the blood vessel to the interstitial area. Um, so that causes a lot of swelling. And for example, if my arm have a lot of swelling and the swellingness will cause obstruction and occlude the blood vessel in my arm, therefore the blood cannot flow uh, from my heart to my hand anymore. So this part of, uh, this part will be um, like can, can have necrosis, it can die because there's no perfusion. So what they do is they can do a fasciotomy, they can cut open this part so that the pressure is relieved and the, can, the circulation can continuously perfusing um, my hand. So that's basically it. Um, intervention, we have to loosen the cast or remove the cast, loosen the traction if complaining of tingling, okay? What is tingling? Tingling is parathesia. It's the first thing from the six Ps. It's always the first side to occur. Uh, wait, okay. So we touched a bit about hip fractures that we talked about earlier. So if we know what is bug traction. It's relating to weight. Um, so we have to do continuously skin assessment for bug traction as well. And bug traction is usually used for short term, pre-operative to immobilize the area. And it's usually used for 48 to 72 hours. Post-op care for patient who go through hip fractures, we have to do neurovascular check, which is, which is the six piece. We have to uh, use the train JP, um, and continuously positioning the patient. Complication of hip fracture surgery is dislocation, infection, avascular necrosis, and DVT. So drain day one is bright red, also known as sanguineous. Blood is expected. Day three blood should be serous sanguineous or sanguineous. 250 ml of blood each hour is bad probably means the patient is bleeding. How to position the patient uh, post-operatively? Neutral position, decreased flexion, low chairs is bad. Abductor pillow, no crossing legs, weight bearing or sleeping on operative site. Okay, so we have to teach the patient to not crossing the legs. Infection is day three, remember it takes three day for infection to occur. If you guys have any questions that regarding infection and it's only day one or day two or before 72 hours, do not choose infections. HOB, meaning head of the bed, it cannot be more than 90 degrees because it will cause flexion of the hip and it, the patient cannot bend down to tie their shoes or travel a long distance because of um, DBT. Right. Uh, fat emboli. Fat emboli is the most common in long bone or pelvic bone fractures. Um, so whenever we have a fractures in the femur, uh, a long bone or a pelvic bone, uh, the fat globules are released into the bloodstream. It creates and trigger a bleeding cascade to occur and the body begins to start bleeding. Platelets will drop, PT, PTT, INR will increase. Platelet is the lower the platelets, the higher risk for the patient to bleeding. PT, PTT, INR, these are the time it takes for the blood to clot. So whenever these increase, it means that it takes longer for the patient to clot. Therefore, um, it's bad patient is hemorrhaging inside. So 24 to 48 hours after the injury is when fat emboli is most likely to occur. Signs symptom of fat emboli includes petechiae on the chest, impending doom, shortness of breath, H and H will go down because they are bleeding and decrease saturation. Intervention, what do we do? We give oxygen, we give fluids or blood, we decrease BT, BTT, INR with vitamin K, okay? I know there's a lot of stuff of information, 
But um, I, what I would take away from this is definitely know the sign symptom, especially the petechiae on the chest. It is a classic sign of fat emboli. Uh, if you guys have a question regarding a patient having a fracture in the long bone or a fracture in the pelvic bone, definitely know that it can cause fat emboli. And if the patient presents petechiae on the chest, it really, we have to really suspect that the patient is having fat emboli. And these are the intervention that we need to do for these patients. All right, crutch, cane, walker, education. Mm, I don't think I need to know. All right, osteomyelitis. So, all right, let me take a sip. Osteomyelitis is basically an infection in the bone. So osteobone-itis is infection. Infecting microorganisms invade by direct or indirect entry, enter to the bones and multiple. It can lead to ischemia, meaning no oxygen, no perfusion, and vascular compromise to occur. Whenever there's no perfusion, it can lead to necrosis and bone death. Systemic circulation can lead. So what, it, what it, does it mean, systemic circulation? It means that the bacteria travel systemically. It enter the bloodstream and it go all over the body. This will lead to sepsis. And when sepsis occur, it can lead to sepsis, septic shock, lead to MODS and death. So you guys don't really need to know that. Just know that osteomyelitis is bone infection and it can lead to sepsis and death. The wound, if not treated, is can go into bone, usually it's caused by Staphylococcus aureus. This is a slow process. Risk factor is pressure ulcers because it's an open entry for the bacteria to go directly to the bone. Open fractures, Penetrating wounds, IV drug user, immunocompromised patient. These patients have no white blood cells or any sort of inflammation process in order to kill the bacteria at all. Vascular compromise, peripheral vascular disease, or diabetic patient. Diabetic mellitus, the reason why this patient is at risk is because vascular perfusion is problematic. They are high at risk because infection will not heal and travel into bone. So we learn about, especially patients with diabetic type 2, they, they will not heal very fast or they the wound doesn't heal at all. And they usually have recurrent yeast infection and vaginal infection. Therefore, they are at significant risk for osteomyelitis. Assessment finding, what lab would you see? Um, we see, well, the first thing we see is RIDA. What is RIDA? RIDA is redness, edema, drainage, and approximations. Fever, of course, because it's a infection. Purulent drainage, infection, and pain, infection. So what lab will we look at? We look at white blood count. It will be more than 11,000. What is the normal range for white blood count? 4,000 to 11,000. This will let us know if there's an infection somewhere. So diagnostic tests, what does diagnostic test mean? This means that we diagnostic, we confirm that the patient having osteomyelitis. The white blood count will be more than 11. We going to check a culture, um, meaning we check the, the, the population of the bacteria uh, that causing osteomyelitis on this specific patient so that we can provide appropriate antibiotic to treat for this patient. And then we do bone marrow biopsy, MRI, CT, X-ray. White blood cow will tell us there is an infection somewhere. Culture are specific and will let us know what's going on. This is the first thing that we do. This is done by surgery and scraping the bones so that we can have a sample, the culture, so that we know we can test for the specific bacteria or viruses. Imaging will let us know how it reached the bone. So treatment. 
So what do we guys have to know for osteomyelitis? Osteomyelitis, the only way to treat it, the only way to treat it is IV antibiotic. Oral antibiotic will not treat this. They need IV antibiotic. We give them blood thinners. We, give, we take care of their wounds. Uh, we do bone debridement. Debridement meaning removal of the necrosis part. So if there's a part of the bone that is dead, we have to remove that part in order to facilitate healing, in order to facilitate healing uh, and removal of these, um, these death tissues or bone fragments. Or we amputate. Amputation is the last resort and it is done when all of other treatments fail. So how do we get IV antibiotic? It is given up to four to six weeks or two to three months, depending on severity. Blood thinners will help to, with vascular compromise to help blood and antibiotic get to the wound faster. Lobonox. How do we give Lobonox? We give them two inches away from the umbilical cord and always make sure that platelet count is more than 100,000. Wound care, if you do not clean wound or put medication on wound, it will get worse. Nursing intervention, long-term IV antibiotics, so the patient often go home with a pig line. It's a long-term line. The wound care will assess. So this patient need IV antibiotic and they cannot just stay in the hospital for six weeks or three months. That's why the patient, the doctor will put a pick line on this patient and then the patient can administer the IV antibiotic at home. Um, hyperbaric, uh, dressing change, wound care, acute, so meaning that they have to immobilize. Hyperbaric is provide oxygen to the tissue and help the patient has trouble healing or patient continues to have issues. So it's, uh, it's a method where they put a lot of oxygen to the area of the wound so that it can promote faster healing. Okay, next we have osteomalacia. Okay, please give me one second. All right, osteomalacia is different with osteomyelitis. So don't get this confused, okay? So, oops, pathology is soft bone, low vitamin D, poor dietary intake of vitamin D and calcium. So basically this is not an infection. It is poor intake of vitamin D and calcium, okay? So risk factor, limited sun exposure, GI malabsorption because of chronic celiac disease, extensive burns, limited sun exposure could be due to skin cancer. Assessment fighting, difficulty walking or rising from the chairs, difficulty getting going, fractures easily. Diagnostic test, cerium, calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D decrease. So calcium, uh, phosphor and vitamin D, and then we do chest, uh, we do x-ray. X-ray will show the mineralization of the bone. Treatment, we give them vitamin D supplements, calcium and phosphor supplements. Calcium and phosphor will have vitamin D absorption. Nurse interventions, what food we do encourage patients to eat. We encourage them to eat eggs, meat, oily fish, like salmon, tuna, shardiness, um, or food that high in calcium, vitamin D supplement. We tell them uh, like fortified milks and cereals. We tell them to go out to, this, to have more sun exposure, do more weight bearing exercise to, so that to promote stimulation of the bone so that they can have dry, drive more calcium into the bone and the bone can be stronger. Tell them to walk, do walking, yoga, tennis, dancing. All right. So osteomalacia, not so severe. It's just deficiency vitamin D and calcium, basically. So this is what you're gonna need to know. Osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is also low calcium and low vitamin D, but it make of the bone is, making of the bone is fast, not fat, fast, but the body cannot process it. 
the bone reabsorptions exceed the bone depositions, low bone mass and fragile bones. Risk factor, thin menopause are the older women. So if there's this term in the, um, the test, uh, bas basically this woman is really at risk for um, osteoporosis. Women who are menopause and skinny, um, uh, white or Asian, more than 65 years old, having secondary lifestyle, smoking, uh, taking GERD medication and drinking alcohol, they are at risk for osteoporosis. Assessment fighting, fractures easily, decline in height, kyphosis, pain in lower extremity. Um, these patients will decrease in height. Uh, as we walk, it put pressure on the spine and compressing the spine. That's why this lady, uh, woman will be shorter when they grow older. Typhosis is the humpback uh, causes by instability of the spine, pain in the lower extremity, back, spine, hip, wrist. Working so much equal a lot of pressure. So how do we diagnostic? We do bone mineral density test. We do T-score and usually it is will show a minus a negative 2.5 or lower. T-score is the greater the negative number, the more severe the osteoporosis is. You guys need to know these two diagnostic tests. How do we treat it pharmacologically? Uh, we give them by phosphonate, inhibit bone reabsorption and help build the bone. Um, Bonevia causes, the side effect is hypocalcemia and renal failure. If creatinine is more than 1.6, we do not give Bonevia. Actinel can cause osteonecrosis of the jaw and renal failure. So this will be good to know for the medical, med, for the med quiz. It will be on the on there, I'm pretty sure, the actinel. The whenever you guys see a question about osteonecrosis of the jaw and, or renal failure, actinel, or no bisphosphonate, which is the class of the med. How do we take it? We take it with a full glass of water, take 30 minutes before auto medication and remain in the upright position 30 minutes after taking that. Side effect is gastritis, anorexia, weight loss, calcium supplement, uh, calcitonin, uh, osteonecrosis. We need to see the dentist throughout treatment. Thing act mouthwash. Gastritis will occur first, then that will cause patient to not eat anorexia, which would then cause patient to lose weight. So knowing by phosphonate medications causes gastritis and lead to losing weight because the patient having anorexia, we have to remember that to give them with a full glass of water, okay? And because this class may cause hypocalcemia, we have to encourage the patient to eat calcium 1,000 uh, 1, to 1, 1,500 milligram with food. Non-pharmacological treatment for osteoporosis include weight-bearing exercise, going out to the sun, quit smoking, stop drinking alcohol, increase vitamin D, prevent um, fractures, meaning safety, Food that should be encouraged include milk, yogurt, cottage cheese, like dairy stuff, and then green, turnip, spinach, sardines. Uh, safety. Okay, so um, NCLEX, HESI, it, they hate rugs. So whenever you guys see rugs in a patient home, we recommend the patient to remove all the rugs to prevent uh, falls and promote safety nets, okay? And they need to have night lights in the house. So I've seen so many rug questions and they are easy, just remove the rugs. They don't like the rugs. Osteoarthritis. Let me take water. Wait, hang on, everyone is doing okay? I know there's so much information. Do you guys need a break or you guys want to go through continuously? We still have about 40, Slide left. 
Is everyone still here? Good. Okay. All right. Well, we're gonna go ahead then. Osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis patho is cartilage destruction damage. It get worse throughout the day. This is the term to remember. This is the term that you guys will be able to use to distinguish between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. So for now, osteoarthritis usually affect lower extremity and larger joints, lower extremities and larger joints. It get worse with use. Risk factor include female obesity, injury, decreased estrogen, frequent kneeling, obesity, more pressure on the cartilage. So assessment fighting for someone who have osteoarthritis is crepitation, um, pain that get worse with use. It affect larger and wear bearing joint, asymmetrical joint involvement. In early stage, rest relief pain. In late stage, nothing relief pain. Crepitation is the cracking sound. It is the biggest assessment finding for patients who have osteoarthritis. And also osteoarthritis affect bigger joint, okay? Bigger joint is like the knee joint. Um, so yeah, and it's asymmetrical, meaning it may happen on one knee, but it doesn't happen on the other knee. How do we diagnose it? Bone scan, MRI, CT, X-ray. Which two are the best? CT and MRI is the best because it will show cartilage damage. Treatment, acetaminophen, NSAIDs, ibuprofen, corticosteroids. We want to manage pain without the drug as much as possible. However, if the patient complaining of so much pain, we give them these medications. Nursing intervention, tell them to regularly exercise, decrease stress on the joint, decrease weight, activity, rest, and balance. Uh, some way to manage pain without medication, um, regular exercise, decrease stress on the joint, uh, splin, heat, decrease stiffness, cold, if they have an acute pain. All right, rheumatoid arthritis. So what I recommend is have a table, one side is osteoarthritis and one side is rheumatoid arthritis. You guys will be able to know the difference between uh, them when you guys put them, put it side by side. So the first thing that we see is autoimmune. Autoimmune meaning the body attack itself. So that's the first difference between, out, be, between rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. The pain gets better with use. Whereas in osteoarthritis, the pain gets worse with use. It affects smaller joints, meaning fingers, whereas the osteoarthritis is affect larger joints, for example, knees. Autoimmune immune system attacks connected tissues. Risk factor, women, age 30 to 50. Assessment fighting, stiffness in the morning, symmetrical joint involvement, so symmetrical, not asymmetrical. This means that patients who are rheumatoid, have rheumatoid arthritis, they usually develop pain uh, and issues on both joints of their hands, not just one side. They have owner drift, remission and exacerbation period. They usually can involve organs and they have a lot of fatigue. Stiffness gets better as you use it. Positive risk factor, um, I mean, positive RF, elevated ESR, increased C-reactive protein. So elevated ESR, uh, this means that the rate, uh, there's an inflammatory response is happening. If there's a, a higher ESR level, it means that the inflammatory process in the body is happening. Increased C-reactive, uh, usually this diagnosed that the patient is having autoimmune disease. And when autoimmune system is going crazy, the body sends protein to try and fix it. How do we treat? We treat it with NSAIDs. So these medication, um, ibuprofen, aspirin, celecoxib, short-term, what do we need to watch out for? So 
NSAIDs, we'll call GI bleeds. And this we can assess by checking the patient's store. Is it dark? Um, meaning that they may have an internal bleed, a GI bleed. Uh, DMARS is uh, telling the immune system to not to attack, basically immunosuppression. We need to tell the patient to avoid six people, good hand hygiene, so methotrexate. Okay, side effect, uh, bone marrow suppressions, hepato hepatotoxicity. So bone marrow suppression, whenever we talk about bone marrow suppression, the bone marrow is the area where it's generate red blood cell, platelet and white blood cells. So if that area is suppressed, what does it cause? It will lead to uh, pancytopenia. The patient will be low on red blood cells, low on white blood cells and low on platelets. So the patient will be on triple um, thing, which is the um, uh, bleeding precaution, uh, neutropenia precautions, and also the um, um, bleeding neutropenia yeah, and also they can have anemia as well. Glucocorticoids, uh, it is used in short term because uh, steroid is really bad for the body. Uh, immunosuppression, uh, steroids, low dose can cause weight gain. Uh, TNF factors, these are Enabrel and Remicade. Avoid infections, avoid live vaccine and test for TB before using. Okay, so tomorrow, Professor Lenasa will talk to you guys more about this drug so you can have a better understanding. This is just a little introduction. Nursing goal for patients who, are rheumatoid, who have rheumatoid arthritis to decrease inflammation, manage pain using ice pack, maintain joint function, wrong uh, range of motion, exercise, water exercise, uh, prevent deformity by splinting and avoid flexions. It's usually they splint at night. Okay. Gout. Ba so we heard a lot about gout before. So what is it? Gout is basically an increase in uric acid. And the body makes uric acid when it breaks down purine purines. Uric acid deposit in connective tissues and joints. So uric acid cannot be broken down and it gets stuck in the joint causing inflammation and tons of pain. And that's why we developed gout because of elevation of uric acid. So what causes gout? It's a high dietary intake of foods that contain purines. And usually men age 30 to 50 who are obese, usually uh, they can add a higher risk for gout. Assessment fighting, they have sudden pain, they have redness in the joint, the right big toe, very painful. So treatment, this drug allopurino is the drug that you guys need to know, not only for message one, message two, but it's also follow you guys to psychiatric and NCLEX. So definitely know allopurino. Allopurino limit the amount of uric acid made in the body. The side effect is rash, lower blood count, and uh, but the main function, the purpose of it is to break down uric, uric acid in the body so that we don't develop gout. Nursing intervention, we need to limit purines in the diet. What food contains purine? Oily fish, bacon, mushroom, asparagus, organ mist, alcohol, Complication, renal issues because uric acid is hard on the kidney. So we need to monitor renal function, meaning we need to monitor the lab of creatine and BUN. So um, that is it for today, you guys. We have a few questions that um, we can do so you guys can um, reinforce the uh, the knowledge. So do you guys want to do it or do you want, uh, want to take a break or how would you guys like to do? But that is all the content that we need, content that we need to know. Let's do it. Okay. Awesome. All right. So the first question, the nurse is conducting health screening for osteoporosis. 
which client is at greatest risk for developing this disorder. Remember osteoporosis. All right, perfect. So four is the correct answer. The patient is having sedentary lifestyle. Uh, she's a woman over 60, 60 or over years old um, and smokes cigarettes. So these are the risk factors for osteoporosis. So if they give you a um, 70 years old man who consume excess alcohol, this patient will be at risk for gout, right? Which cast care instruction should the nurse provide to a client who just had a plaster cast applied to the right forearm? So what do we choose to make sure that the patient is safe? Select or apply. Anybody? Okay, I have one, two, three. I have one, three. Okay, let's see what the choices are. So the correct choices are one, two, three. So um, we only have to keep the cast clean and dry. We have to allow the cast of 24 to 72 hours to dry, uh, keep the cast and extremity elevated because we want to promote what? We want to promote venous return. Um, expect tingling and numbness in the extremity. No, we don't want this. This is bad. This is a sign symptom of the uh, compartment syndrome. Use hair dryer set on warm to hot setting. No, we only use cool if we want to prevent itching or relieve itching. So no, we don't choose that. Use soft padded object that would fit under the cast to scratch the skin under the cast. No, 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 no. Okay, next, a client with a hip fracture asks the nurse why bug traction is being applied before surgery. The nurse provide a response based on which purpose of bug traction. So what did, what did we use bug traction for? Okay, so let's see. Perfect. So bug traction is used to promote comfort and reducing muscle spasm and provide fracture immobilization. So there's only two, two immobilization techniques that you, we need to know. That is the manual, uh, that is the bug structure and the skeletal. The bug structure is the one that used the weight and what to remember about it, never leave the weight touch the floor. The second is the skeletal traction, which also you to immobilize the extremity after the fractures. However, with the skeletal, they use pins. And what do we need to worry about? Infections. And we have to clean what? We have to clean the crust. It, it is an aseptic technique. We don't have to be sterile about it. All right, next, a community health nurse is providing an education session for the community members regarding dietary measures that will assist in reducing the risk of osteoporosis. The nurse should instruct the community members to increase dietary intake of which food known to be helpful in minimizing this risk. So keyword osteoporosis and which food minimizing the risk of osteoporosis.
Okay, one yogurt, perfect, awesome. Next, the nurse is performing a neurovascular assessment on a client with a cast on the left lower leg. The nurse notes the presence of edema in the foot below the cast. The nurse should make which interpretation about this? So what do I say about swelling, edema? Perfect, impaired venous return. So edema in the extremity indicates impaired venous return. Signs of impaired arterial circulation in the limb include coolness and paler of the skin and diminished arterial pulse. Sign of infection under cast area would include odor of prurient drainage from the cast and the presence of hotspot, which are areas of the cast that feel warmer to the touch than the rest of the cast. So that is the hot spot. But for this question, impaired venous return is the cause of edema because whenever the blood is not returning to the heart, where does it stay? It stay in that area. It causes something called pooling of the blood. And whenever there's a pooling of the blood, there will be swelling, there will be clots. The nurse is caring for a client with a long bone fractures at risk for fat embolism. The nurse specially monitor for earliest sign of this complication by performing assessment of which items? So it's an emboli, what does it cost? All right, we have number four. Perfect. So neurological and respiratory system are the two earliest signs that they will present. Then because the embolism, they can obstruct the blood perfusion to the brain or perfusion to the heart. So it may show that the patient, I mean, to the lungs. So it may show that the patient may have difficulty breathing or the patient may have uh, changes in level of consciousness. All right. The nurse is caring for a client who was just admitted to the hospital with a diagnosis of a fractured right hip sustained from a fall five hours earlier. The nurse developed a plan of care for the client and includes intervention related to monitoring for sign of fat embolism. Which fighting should be listed in the care plan for a sign symptom of fat embolism? All right, I have. One, perfect, dyspnea and chest pain. So lungs and level of consciousness, dip, difficulty breathing, chest pain, usually this, this earlier sign of fat embolism. The nurse is caring for a client who had developed compartment syndrome from a severely fractured arm. The client asks the nurse how this can happen. The nurse should respond incorporating which piece of information. So compartment syndrome. Three, perfect. You guys are on fire, you guys just so good. You, you guys are gonna be fine. Everyone gonna pass HESI. So yeah, bleeding and swelling is, will cause increased pressures in the area that cannot expand and therefore it'll lead to um, reduce ineffective tissue perfusions. All right, just a few more questions, you guys. We got this. A nurse has provided instruction to a client with diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis about measures to protect the joint, which statement by the client indicate a need for further instruction. So we choose something that is wrong. Need for further instruction.
All right, we have number one, pain or fatigue is expected, and I should try to continue with the activity if this occur. No, so that's wrong completely. The client should be instructed to use pain or fatigue as an indicator and guide to increase and maintain or decrease an activity level. If pain or fatigue is experienced, the client should rest. Whenever possible, the client should use large joint instead of small joint for activity and use, should use the joint in most natural position. The client should learn to slide object rather than lifting them and not remaining in the same position for a long time. Okay, next, a client has been diagnosed with osteomalacia or adult rickets. The nurse plan of care knowing this disorder, what affects an adult result from deficiency of which vitamin? Hit me, guys. Okay, perfect. Vitamin D. Okay. Osteomalacia, deficiency of vitamin D and calcium. Okay, so that's it for today, you guys. Good job, everyone. Thank you so much for staying until the end. Um, you guys were amazing. Uh, is there anything else that I can help you guys with? Any question that you guys would like me to answer? Okay, stop sharing. You guys got through it. You're welcome. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, feel free to leave. Thank you, everyone. I will post this later. Thank you. Bye, everyone.